We're in Revelation 22. And I managed to get to two verses uh, this time. Uh, verses 6 and 7. This is lesson 15 in the drama of the ages 4. It says in verse 6, Revelation 22, 6, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Let's pray that the Lord would add his blessing more time together. From the days of, uh, uh, early days of television, some of the shows would uh, go through their different uh, acts, if you will, or stages, and then at the end they would have an epilogue. An epilogue. And this is a type of epilogue for the book of Revelation when we get into these verses. And that's why I entitled it that way up at the uh, top of the outline. An epilogue of a play is a scene that comments on or summarizes the main action. So it kind of pulls it all together. John, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, has, uh, beginning in Revelation 22, 6, written not the epilogue necessarily to the book of Revelation, but to the entire Word of God. Because it's... All the pieces are coming together, as we've seen so many times. It's amazing how many references to Jeremiah and Isaiah, and certainly to books like Daniel and Ezekiel, there are in the book of Revelation. So there's a lot that's coming together. It's a summation of what has happened, what is happening, <laughs> and what will happen. Rather than an ending, it's a beginning. Band-Aids were invented and first used in 1920. Thomas Anderson, who was an employee with Johnson & Johnson, saw that his wife in cooking the meals was sustaining a lot of burns and cuts. And so he came up with the Band-Aids idea so that she could go ahead and treat herself if he wasn't around or couldn't get to a hospital for the minor burns and cuts. They weren't very popular at first, uh, but in 1924, they came up with a sterilized Band-Aid, and that seemed to make the difference where people were concerned. Millions of them were shipped overseas during World War II. The first decorated ones. How many of you like decorated Band-Aids? Like with, what are some of the decorated ones? Probably everything, right? Superhero, Spider-Man, <coughs> Mickey Mouse, all that kind of stuff. My Pretty Pony. What's that? My Pretty Pony. Yeah, Pretty Pony, yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, so those were first, uh, they first came out in 1951. Johnson & Johnson uh, estimates that they have sold more than 100 billion Band-Aids. The word band in German actually means tape, and that seems to fit. The term Band-Aid has come to have a bit of a negative, negative uh, meaning when someone says a solution is just a Band-Aid to the problem. It's like, well, the problem's too big, and the solution that you're offering isn't enough. That means that it's uh, no real solution, just a delay of a more serious problem. Band-Aids have been uh, pretty popular over the years. We have some sitting in the kitchen in there. And in a way, the Band-Aid solution is the best kind of solution because it involves solving a problem with the, minimum, with the minimum amount of effort, time, and cost. And all of us like that. We like problems solved with a minimum of effort, time, and cost. Nothing wrong with that. Band-Aids kind of represent that a little bit. People often don't like the idea that their problems aren't quite as complicated or as comprehensive as they think they are. So in other words, you know, God's word offers simple solutions. It's not, I wouldn't put it in the category of a band-aid, but it offers a simple solution to our complicated problems, and many people almost react as if it can't be that easy. It can't be that simple, but it, it is. We know that the uh, full remedy of what has been uh, taking place through the book of Revelation and what is taking place even in the world today uh, won't take place until the book of Revelation is completely fulfilled. But we know that it will be and that it will happen exactly as the book says it will happen. Until then, what it has to tell us must be applied if it's to mean anything to us personally. Revelation is no different from any other book in God's Word, such as Colossians, which is a uh, comparatively easier book to understand and one that you can say, oh yeah, I see how that fits. I see how that applies. Revelation does too, uh, in different ways, but it applies just as much. The angel that has brought, uh, uh, has been leading John through these last few verses affirms 
that what John has been given to see and note will happen exactly as revealed. Verse 6. This type of statement is seen several times uh, in the book of Revelation by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And when we read it, it seems rather fantastic. And we have all of God's word, even so, to confirm what it says. Imagine how John must have felt when he was seeing all this on the Isle of Patmos. Basically exiled there pretty much by himself. You may not have thought about it this way, but if you were to read the four other books with John's name on them, and that's kind of portrayed on the on that chart that you have, you'd get a pretty good picture of the total gospel message from the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. You get a, a pretty full spectrum of what God's Word is all about. Each of the other three Pentateuchs are exactly that way. You see that on the chart, such as the first Pentateuch. If you had no other section of God's Word, thankfully we do, but if you had no other section of God's Word, that contains all the foundational issues that you would need to come to a conclusion about the message of salvation, because that's where it begins is in the book of Genesis. And the same could be said with the Psalms, and we know that about the Psalms, and I broke that down for you. The Psalms, or the Psalter, is broken down into five separate scrolls. And you may have a Bible that breaks that down for you, just as I've given it for you there on the chart. You could read from Psalm 1 all the way through Psalm 150, and you'd get a really good picture of the gospel message and what God's all about. And I certainly get that with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. And so you can see that all of these four Pentateuchs, and I think the really interesting part of it is that they all hook together thematically. And hopefully you can pick up on that on that chart. The John's writings, especially 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and not so much Revelation or the Gospel of John, but 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John were a little bit harder to match thematically, but I gave you some verses there that would do that for you. So each of the Pentateuchs touch on particular themes that link them together from the beginning of God's Word to the very end. It's all connected. You can't say, well, I just read the Gospels. You, because the Gospels are going to point you somewhere else. And if you're really researching, you're going to be led to the book of Genesis or the fourth scroll of the Psalter. Or you're going to be led to 1 John. You're going to find these uh, how it coordinates this way. They affirm and they confirm one another. In fact, I think I can make a pretty good uh, case that the four Pentateuchs match up thematically in order for the purpose of sending a very clear message regarding the nature and function of God's Word because it all connects like your life and mine. There is no incident in your life that is disconnected from everything else and everyone else that knows you and everyone else that has ever known you and everyone else that will ever know you. So the things that are going on in your life right now are going to have impact on the people that you will know tomorrow, or the next week, or the next year, or the next 10 years, should the Lord tarry, because it changes you, and it has impact on them. The chart shows this uh, unity and symmetry. While it shows balance, it also shows dependence, because they are dependent on each other. These books are designed to confirm one another, and you can take one of the books out, you, you can't rather, out of the presentation without destroying the balance and symmetry of all the rest. You can't say, well, like I know Brother Randy's uh, favorite book is the book of Leviticus. He's really into that, and he quotes it all the time, but uh, you can't take, you can't say, book of Leviticus, that's too hard for me, I don't like it. So I'm just going to read all the way around it, you're going to miss a lot that you need as a believer in Jesus Christ today regarding balance and symmetry. You see how each of these books are connected to each other. And that to remove one or to downplay another would throw the, all the rest of them out of sync. Again, in Revelation 22, 6, the angel tells John that what he has seen is faithful and true. As I've mentioned before, many times there are primarily three types of faith. This faithful here is the one that is mentioned the least, but is also the deepest type of faith. So we'll talk about it. Number one, there's mental persuasion, which is very basic, a very basic form of faith. Uh, almost anybody could have a mental persuasion that God is God. 
You could be, have you ever known anybody that knows that God is God, and yet they're not a believer? You ever known anybody that, well, yeah, I believe God's word is true, but I don't apply to my own life. So they're not saved? Is that possible? Did somebody say that? Well, yeah, I believe God is God. Were there people that, look, well, what about the leadership of the Sanhedrin? Is there an indication that they knew that Jesus was a Messiah? Yes. Were they saved? No. Not as far as we know. Not up in, you know, maybe they did it at the last second. I hope they did, but so they knew he was the Messiah, and they, of, of all people, knew that he was fulfilling the scripture. They knew that, and yet they still rejected him. So you can know that God's word is true. You can know that God is God and still not be saved. That would have to say that, unfortunately, I know a lot of people that are in that condition. They're mentally persuaded. For example, even, the, I mentioned this before, the devil himself is mentally persuaded that God is God. Do you know that? So in this way, you can say at the most superficial level, the devil has faith because he's mentally persuaded. Don't think, well, yeah, you know, I'm mentally persuaded that God is God, and that's good enough. No, it's not. That is not good enough. But uh, he's fully aware of what Christ accomplished, uh, the enemy is. He knows what Christ accomplished with his life, his death, and his resurrection. And yet, you wouldn't, uh, no one in their correct mind would say, yes, he's saved. So you can, be, you can have that type of faith. There's a type of faith that is so much in agreement with God's word that it naturally produces that which could be termed constitutionally good. Right? So you're so much in agreement with God's word that if necessary, you're willing to invest everything that you have in the work of God. Right? You're willing to invest in it. What does God expect of an investment of his people at a bare minimum. Tithing, right? Tithing. And that's a start. That's all it is. And really, tithing, as important as it is and as vital as it is to the church, that's a beginning and it's an act of obedience and worship. And that's why uh, we talk about tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings. And we need to get into that habit. So we are so in agreement with what God's Word says that we produce that which could be considered uh, constitutionally good, which means not good just by our definition, but good in a way that can be verified by God's Word, the Constitution. In other words, if we truly agree with God's Word, there will be undeniable evidence in our lives that we do agree. And being in agreement with God brings change and it brings results. I always felt that there was uh, maybe a little bit more to Matthew 18 than uh, what might meet the eye. Let's look at it. Matthew 18. And you'll be familiar once we uh, read these verses. Matthew 18. You'll be familiar with this. Verse 19. Matthew 18, 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you, right, you're familiar with this, shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So what does that mean if you're praying by yourself? You don't have any spiritual juice? What does that mean? I mean, so, in other words, you're praying, you know, you're, you're earnest in your prayer, you're tearing before God, you're, maybe you came to the sanctuary to pray, you know, get, get yourself in the right uh, type of frame of mind, and you're thinking, man, I don't have a chance of getting any of this answered unless somebody else shows up and we can agree together. Is that what that means? I think that's a little too limiting, to be honest with you. I think what's being, uh, I think it means what it says, but I think we have to expand it a little bit to, do you think you need to be in agreement with, agreement with the Holy Spirit? Yes. Do you think he's present and leading you in prayer when, when you pray? Do you think you need to be in agreement with the Son of God? With God the Father? Do you think they're present when you pray? Yes. So where two or three are gathered together? So is it, when we come into a season of prayer, we you say that that kind of qualifies in Matthew 18, 19, and 20, that if we're in agreement with the Holy Spirit, you and the Holy Spirit, how many is that? Two, right? So if two or three 
are gathered together, then we can agree with the Holy Spirit, and that means that we'll get uh, the results that we're looking for, the ones that uh, that we want, mainly what uh, what He wants for us, which should be the same thing. The third type of faith is one that is so thoroughly saturating our lives that everything that we say and do speaks of Christ and his total influence on our life. This is the type of faith that's being talked about in Revelation 22, 6 with the word faithful. This means that our faith is worthy to be believed. We need more people whose stated faith is worthy to be believed and can be backed up because they're in agreement with God's word, resulting in productivity, and then they are leading a life that is an example of what it truly means to be a person of faith. This is the type of faith that I think incorporates the other two as well. And somebody that is worthy to be believed has got to be mentally persuaded that God is God. And if their faith is worthy to be believed, they've, they've got to be in agreement with God's word. And so this level of faith incorporates the other two, while the other two, especially number one, may not incorporate the others. But this one incorporates the first two. So this is where we want to be. This is where every believer needs to be, is that our faith is worthy to be believed. It would be a good thing if somebody looked at your life as a believer and said, well, your faith really isn't worthy to be believed. Oh, that'd be devastating, wouldn't it? Somebody knew that somebody felt that. Uh, about you. Their faith isn't worthy to be believed. They don't live it. They don't believe it. They really don't trust in God's word. So every believer needs to have this. Generally, if you want to prove that an artifact is genuine, you have to go to someone that's considered an expert in the field of authentication. This is what uh, we're talking about. We talk about the word true, as it's used in uh, verse 6. A little bit different type of word, but it basically means something that is genuine or authentic. There's another word in, uh, in that verse, it's a little bit, uh, true is a little bit uh, different than the word logos, although it is a form of that word. Another word in the verse that would be very easy to overlook, but it, I think it might be even the most important word of them all, and that's sayings, sayings. He said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. It means intelligent, these are intelligent sayings. What I've brought across to you, the Holy Spirit is saying, is there's been an intelligent expression that has been given to you. This is how God wants to speak to us. It's how Jesus referred to himself, and it was John that was led to write of him in another place. In the beginning was the intelligent expression, and the intelligent expression was with God. Read it from John 1.1. 1, 1. And the intelligent expression was God. Word, word, word. The intelligent expression. In verse 14 of that same chapter, John wrote, and the intelligent expression was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's how God wants to reach to us. He, he wants to reason with us. And there you have the number one reason that you have a brain. Right? It's to use it intelligently. And for God, the creator of the universe, omniscient, knowing all things, wants to reason with each one of us. There are two other words that we uh, need to look at, grace and truth. You'll remember that the uh, Gospel of uh, John is the only book of the uh, Pentateuch that serves as a dual thematic purpose. It's the only one on your chart that is like that. You'll find John on there in two different places. One of those uh, themes is stated in this verse as shown in, uh, in your chart is, uh, is grace. He's saying, and again, referring back to uh, the Gospel of John. But uh, the other word in John 1.14 is, and I'm talking about John 1.14, the other word in John uh, 1.14 is true. And this is the word aletheia that you have undoubtedly heard before. It means an unveiled reality agreeing with an appearance, an unveiled reality. That's how we need to lead our lives. All the realities in our lives are unveiled. Do you, do you know why that needs to take place now? Because it will, it will take place later. The things that are veiled in our life 
will be brought out into the open, into the light of God. And that's a reality that we have to deal with. And that can be stated as a theme for the book of Revelation. When Christ came the first time, would you say it was an unveiling of reality? Yes. Here's Christ. He says, here I am. I'm, I'm reachable. I'm touchable. Yes. This is what God is all about. About reaching out to others, doing away with the penalty of sin, washing away the sins, the ultimate sacrifice. All of the motives in the first appearance of Christ, all of the motives and methods of God were shown in his life, his death, and his resurrection. The reality of who he is is also unveiled in Revelation, isn't it? There's several different places, but you can't help but think of Revelation 19. He's really unveiled there. He's the same one. Is he the same one that came the first time? Yes. Absolutely. But this is a full manifestation of all of who he is. I said that the word uh, sayings may be the most important word, Revelation 22, 6. <laughs> this verse, the beginning of the scriptural epilogue, is pulling all of the remaining pieces together. I think that there are many that feel that Revelation is simply too difficult to study and far too difficult to understand. And yet this verse refutes that. When it says, these sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must be shortly or shortly be done. Some of you, uh, probably not all of you, may remember uh, some years ago, we had uh, an individual teach on the book of Revelation. And in coordinating some of those lessons, the individual came to me one time and said, in essence, God has given me a new insight that has never been seen before and never heard before. And I said, oh, really? I said, well, you know, tell me about it. So he went down to sing and I said, well, that's not new. I said, I've heard that talk in other places. We've taught that here. And I think it put him in a state of shock. It shouldn't have. But during the course of that study, which was very... In, intricate, I think it'd be a, a way of looking at it. By the end of it, I was about at my own wit's end. <laughs> because it, it made, it, you know, when we come together like this, we open up God's Word, wherever it is, the issue is not to make it more difficult. The issue is not to make it so tedious and so intricate that nobody could possibly understand it. It's to open it up and let the Holy Spirit, do you think the Holy Spirit does that? If the Holy Spirit's in control, what's He doing? He's giving you clarity. Yes. And he's, he's opening up God's word to you. Saying, <coughs> he's saying to us, yes, this may be a more challenging passage, but I'm here to help you understand it. And so that's why we come together like we do, is to understand God's word, not to leave after a lesson and say, what in the world was all that about? I know you've never said that with any of the lessons that I've done, I'm sure, but I'm really assuming a lot on that, but... But again, this verse, uh, verse 6 in Revelation 22, kind of refutes that God made it complicated. He did make it complicated. He gave it to us so we could understand it. The book of Revelation has been given to us in a way for that purpose, in the insight that wasn't given even to one such as Daniel. You realize that? Daniel was brilliant. I mean, he's one of the few characters in God's Word where there's no hint of anything inappropriate like a doubt or wavering in his walk or he made a massive mistake that you know cost people their lives he's one of the few figures where there isn't any negative hint of anything about him do you know that with the book of revelation you know more than daniel did do you know that yes. do you have you ever thought of it that way that you've been given an insight that daniel didn't have I mean, he was given some amazing visions, and he was somebody, he was an interpreter of dreams. Just He did some, some simply amazing things by the power of God. This intelligent expression was given to John, and it was given to us for our understanding, for us to get it. The Holy Prophets also are mentioned in suggesting that all the pieces that God has given regarding his plan down through the ages have been pulled together. And they all served a purpose, just like you and I are, in the fulfillment of God's plan. 
People can have a better understanding of God's word simply by the way that you live. They may never open up God's word, but if they see you and you're leading the life, then didn't Paul write somewhere that we're living epistles, right? Read and known of all men. Right? You, you know you're a living epistle no matter what you believe anyway. You know that, don't you? You know that you may be kind of hit and miss and you walk with the Lord and you're still a living epistle. We're all testimony of something, hopefully for the right things. The Holy Spirit can help us with that. We have to consider much of what we have seen here as a preview since it hasn't happened yet. But no matter. As the word has indicated, these things are to be lived today, not tomorrow. The book of Revelation is for today. We can know what's coming because it tells us that. But its greatest value, I think, is that we can say, I've got it and I'm going to start living that today. Late I've started to pray, and you may have heard me pray this way, for God to bless us in direct proportion to how we have received his word. You know, I should have prayed like that years ago. But it almost goes without saying, because that's the only way he blesses us. You know, after a study or a sermon, you know, if, if, and I understand people are tired and, and distracted, and probably when they're talking about me, they probably are angry half the time. But... It always works that way. You are always, I am always directly, uh, blessed rather, directly in proportion to how much of God's word I have received. And how much do you think is appropriate? When God is, uh, when there's an expounding from God's word, the Holy Spirit is leaving, or leading rather, and do you think it would be okay to say, well, if I had to put a percentage to it, 98% of that's okay with me. That 2% is probably the thing that's gonna save your life. It's only 100% is the thing that warrants God's blessing. He understands that sometimes we struggle in, in getting it, putting all the pieces together, and he continues to work with us. But as long as we don't put qualifiers on it, well, God, you know, I have a little bit of a problem with that. I don't necessarily think I'm going to accept that. Uh, you can bring your complaint to God. Just listen to his answer and accept his answer. He'll, he'll hear you. I can easily say that... Uh, that should almost go without saying that type of prayer, that, uh, that type of blessing. Because we will never be blessed beyond what we have received of the Word. It isn't a reasonable thing for us to think, or you might say intelligent expectation to be blessed by God when we do not receive His Word in its very understandable form and format, just like it tells us here in Revelation 22.6. These verses are relatively uncomplicated compared to the rest of the book of Revelation. But it's interesting because I'm having a, a time getting through these verses because of what they're saying and how they're pulling all of these pieces together. Not difficult in bringing them forth, but difficult in covering more than one, two, or three verses each lesson. We should have, uh, you know, going by what I was doing with the rest of the uh, book, we should have been through already. But I'm not hurrying. That's the Meridian's fault because I said, once you're through, you gotta start over. So I'm really dragging along, all right? So John hears the voice of the Son of God in uh, verse 7, affirming that the time is indeed short, and that there could be no time wasted in making sure that what he has been given is shared with all who are willing to receive it. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. I like verse 20, and that's skipping ahead. We'll get to it eventually. It's almost an answer to this where it's repeated. Where the Son of God says, surely I come quickly. And when we say amen to that, that's where that interpretation comes in. It's a Chinese interpretation of the word amen. May it be exactly so. Surely I come quickly. May it be exactly so. Even so. Come, Lord Jesus. And that should be our response to what he's saying. Verse 7, behold, I come quickly. Come. Come quickly. We shouldn't hesitate on that. We shouldn't have any reservation about that. Lord, if, you were, if you're going to come quickly, come now. 
Come as quick as you want to. We're, we're ready. We're waiting. When Christ says that he comes quickly, it means he will come without delay. It also means, which probably is a little bit more appropriate for us regarding the rapture of the church, he will come suddenly. Suddenly. That's why we have to be ready and looking. I shared this with a uh, family this morning when I went out. <clears throat> I went out to warm up the car. As I opened the door, I saw something move behind my right shoulder. And it was all, you know, naturally dark out of that. And so I look, and I don't know, about five or six feet away, maybe about where the edge of the piano was, there was a big uh, cow, moose, standing there looking at me. And there was nothing in between that moose and me. But I had the door open, got in, closed her real quickly. And then I went, I, when I finally was going to leave, I thought, you know, I better look around a little bit. So I went over and I looked around the edge of the house because I'd seen her run off. And she was there right around the edge of the house like she was waiting for me. <laughs> and then when she saw me, she came out and, and stood. And I got the car in between her and I. And then uh, we were pulling out tonight. There, there's a tree over there or something that she liked. She was back again. And uh, let's see, you've got to be, uh, you've got to be ready, don't you? Always. You've got to be observant. You've got to be looking for the Son of God. Always. That's how you, because he says, I'm going to come suddenly. That's not something you want to catch, uh, be caught by surprise. It's been 2,000 years since John received that message from God, give or take, in a decade or two, about 2,000 years. However, that is how we reckon time. Because you could say, well, you know, Jesus said, you know, I'm going to come quickly and, you know, delay, without delay and suddenly, and yet it's been 2,000 years. In the context of eternity, in the heavenly calculation, only two days have passed and that's, since that statement was made. Two days. Second Peter 3, 8. Since Jesus made that statement, only two days have passed in the scheme of eternity. So the message should not be missed that with that taken into account, the day of his appearing, for those that follow him according to his word, the rapture of the church could happen at any moment by any standard of any measurement. I do believe that's true. I think that's why 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it doesn't really refer to days or hours. It says in the twinkling of an eye, faster than you can blink. We are to guard, keepeth, is the word that uh, is used in verse 7 in uh, Revelation 22. So we're to guard what we have been given to understand. And again, again the word sayings used in that verse, logos, is used uh, meaning that it uh, has been given to us in a way that we can understand within the scope of our intelligence as it exists right now. If that is true, then there should also be an urgency that we feel in our own heart and mind from the people around us in particular. We realize that we are on the same scriptural page with the Holy Spirit and that we are on his timetable, not ours. Now think about it, if you led your life that way. You know, when I, uh, I was sharing this with uh, Brother Tim the other night. When I went to the Air Force, I was 17. And so at that time, I don't know if they still do that, but uh, my parents had to sign me in. And I thought that's what I, I wanted to do. And I went into late enlistment. And about the time, as a, as a uh, time to go in, I uh, drew closer and said, man, have I ever made a mistake? But I figured, well, I'd sign all this paperwork, all this, blah, blah, blah. And so we go, and so we went to the uh, induction center, and they take us into the induction center and raise your right hand and, you know, pledge to defend the Constitution and all this other stuff. And once we were through and we put our hands down, the drill instructor goes, I just want you all to know that until you were sworn in, you could have walked out of this door and there was no obligation whatsoever. And then the yelling started. <laughs> because, because then he knew, all right, you are mine, you know, so. But uh, again, the, I knew at that time, you know, and I, I kind of looked back on it, I thought, well, you know, it was, I kind of did that on my own timetable. I was too young to go in, but. Another way to look at it is, well, I got it out of the way while I was still young, so I could go do something else. But the epilogue of the book of Revelation and the prologue, the beginning, sound very similar as they're presented. It's a circle that's being completed. 
from Revelation 1 to Revelation 22. And that can be said of all scripture. It's a circle that's being completed. It's all intended to get us back to where we should have been all along. And that is why when we get serious about our relationship with Jesus Christ, it fits more naturally than anything else that we've ever experienced. It fits. It works. The things that we have been given and all these lessons of this study are a treasure that should affect everything that we do and everything that we consider. What are you going to do with the insight of what's coming the way this, of this world and the tribulation. What are you going to do with that information? You got to do something with it. You know, if you have family or friends or loved ones that are not saved, and the rapture were to happen right now, you know what they'd be going through. See, that's why we can use that information now. We can use that insight now as a motivation for ourselves and for others to make a decision one way or the other. Actually, they've already, uh, in some sense, have already made a decision, but it's not too late right now. So we live and operate within the context of these pages and what they tell us about the past, present, and future. John would never be the same after seeing all these things and after communing with God as he has been doing. This marvelous, overwhelming vision and insight. I mean, how could he be? He could never be the same. As we've turned through these sacred pages, a deeper transformation in each one of our hearts and minds should have been taking place. And there is more to come as we close out this study, but one writer put it this way, what you learn only means something if, you, if it means something to you personally. What you learn only has meaning if it means something to you personally. That's true of God's word. It has meaning beyond that, but for you personally, because that's how it's written. You can look at it this way. This word, as a letter, would have been delivered from God to you if you were the only one that ever existed. It's a letter from God to you personally. John would see that there are always larger issues, ramifications involved in what God is doing. But John would also realize that there is no issue more significant to God mentioned anywhere in Scripture, and really throughout Scripture in one sense, there's no issue more significant to God than what's going on in our heart and in our mind. There's nothing more important than that. So he stabilizes us. He clarifies his plan so that we can appreciate it and be a part of it. That's what he wants, for us to be a part of it.